I've been told that my uh, stole, which moves, had moved. Would you join me in prayer? Wondrous God, we come this day. It's sunny outside. It's cold. But the sun shines upon our hearts and our lives. May, with that sunlight, may our hearts be stirred to one another. That we might hear these words of Paul in new ways that would speak to the relationships built down through the centuries and in our own lives, in our own relationships. Bless and keep us in your care as we hear your word. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We entered Advent last Sunday with the choir leading us through the Christmas story and narrative and song. They did us a favor by connecting the biblical story with the contemporary story. They reminded us that the Holy Family ended up as refugees guided by angels to safety. And with that broader story in mind, both ancient and modern, we hear the Advent invitation to prepare ourselves for the Advent that took place some 2,000 years ago and the Advent that is yet to come. The path that we'll be taking will lead us to that moment on Christmas Eve when we hear the message that Jesus is the reflection of God's glory and the one who sustains all things by his word. Hearing that message, we can join the angels in singing Gloria in excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest. Christmas Eve will come soon enough, but there is still more to do before we get there. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope. Today, we lit the candle of peace. We lit it in the hope that peace will come someday to all of creation. And while the candle, of, while the candle speaks of peace, that word peace, if you notice, didn't appear anywhere in this reading from Scripture, at least not explicitly. While that is true, that doesn't mean that peace isn't present in the message that Paul writes to the Philippian church. We just have to dig a little deeper into the words to find it. Perhaps we find it in Paul's prayer that love will overflow with insight and knowledge, so that the reader, both ancient and modern, might determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless. These words from Paul's letter offer us a pathway that leads to a harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Standing, though, at the heart of this pathway is a recognition of the importance of friendship. Yes, Paul's letter to the Philippians is a reflection of a deep and abiding friendship between himself and the Philippian church. We can see this in the opening words, in the opening words of the letter, the depth of this friendship and how it sustained Paul as he sat in prison. Yes, Paul found peace while sitting in a jail cell because of the friendship that existed between himself and this congregation. They weren't, Paul and the Philippians, mere acquaintances. They were committed to each other. And there is a word here worth hearing as we move through Advent toward Christmas. A word about deep and abiding friendships and how they sustain us. There is something different about this letter, this Philippian letter. Even though Paul writes from prison with a few problems to deal with, because whenever Paul writes a letter, there will be a couple of problems to deal with. That's why he writes. But there's something deeper, something different about it. A different spirit is here than maybe you would read in the Corinthian letters or Galatians. As I pondered the passage with some help from my commentaries, I realized that the message that was emerging from this passage had to do with the importance of deep and abiding friendships. 
The very first words we hear from Paul in this reading are, I thank my God every time I remember you. I thank my God every time I remember you. I don't remember Paul writing words like that to the Corinthian or the Galatian churches. They were causing Paul a lot of headaches. So I don't think he was thanking God every time he remembered them. But he did write these words to this church, the Philippian church. And the letter is marked by joy and hope and love. And Paul speaks here of love overflowing. And then in verse 7, Paul tells the readers, I have good reason to think this way about all of you because I keep you in my heart. You, he writes to the Philippians, you are all my partners in God's grace, both during my time in prison and in the defense and support of the gospel. I keep you in my heart. In other words, there is mutual love and affection between Paul and this congregation that sustains him even though he is enduring imprisonment. It is, as Theodore Wardlaw suggests, this letter is a personal handwritten letter that is laced with love. And Cynthia Campbell writes, this letter is not abstract theology. I like abstract theology, but it's not what's in this letter. Its purpose is not primarily instructive, though there's a time and place for that. This is a letter, she says, that shows what Christian friendship looks like and how deeply joyful it is. Now, this wasn't the first word that I heard when I first read the passage. I was looking for something else, something that spoke of Advent and preparation for receiving the good news that Jesus is coming. After all, this is the first time I get to preach in Advent, so, you know, I wanted to prepare people. But there's a different word that emerged and that had to do with friendship. At, that is, and this is, after all, this word about friendship is wrapped up in a letter that is filled with joy, which is the explicit theme of the fourth chapter of Philippians, which we'll hear next Sunday. When we gather next Sunday, we'll hear the invitation to rejoice in the Lord always. And remember, Paul writes the letter, the call to rejoice in the, uh, in the Lord always while he sits in a prison cell. He's not enjoying life at the Caribbean. He's in jail, but he can write that word. I know this is a busy season. It's easy to get overwhelmed by everything. While there may be much to get ready for in preparation for Christmas, it's good to stop and ponder Paul's words about what it means to be a true and loyal friend. So take a moment. Think about your friendships. Who are your friends? What do they mean to you? How have they been there for you? How do they sustain you in difficult times? These friendships might be recent or they might go back to your childhood. These are relationships. These are friendships that you treasure. People who have been with you through thick and thin. They stand with you even when you're not in complete agreement with each other about things. You know, things like well, religion and politics, for instance. <laughs> Just maybe these are the people to whom you will entrust your lives or the lives of family members. As I thought about my own friendships, a whole bunch of people came to mind. Some of these friends I've known most of my life. Others are more recent. 
The ones that go back way in the back of my life are people like my family's neighbors in Mount Shasta, the Greys. Two, two summers back, Cheryl and I stopped to have lunch with Don, Mary, Doug, and their spouses. Unfortunately, David and his spouse were not present, not living in Mount Shasta, but it got, there was this opportunity to stop and to get together for a few moments. And it felt like, for me, a family reunion. And you have to understand, I don't, my family, I haven't seen my cousins since I was like in high school. I haven't seen aunts and uncles since the back then. So sometimes our French, our family are not our literal blood family, they're, they're friendships. And they may go back to when we were children like the greys. And it was fun just to share stories. In fact, it was a little, at times, a little embarrassing to hear Mary or Doug tell stories about me because they were a bit older than Don and I. Don and I were the same age, but Mary was my babysitter, you know, so she knew, she knew stories that, and, and I won't tell you the stories. (laughs) You know, walking home from school and, well, I won't tell you. It's just too embarrassing. But it, but it was, here's the thing, the conversation was full of joy. And I felt like family. I felt this was my family. And I was joyful in all of that. I could go on and I could name other friendships because I have other friendships who mean, their lives mean much to me. They're like family as well. They're f- friendships that developed in elementary school, high school, college, seminary and beyond, people I keep in my heart because of what we've shared over the years. But this will have to suffice for now. But hopefully my sharing causes you to think about the people who mean much to you, the friendships that you have developed over time. And with friendship on my mind, I found myself listening to George W. Bush offer his eulogy for his father. I was driving to the church for Bible study on Wednesday, and, and I was listening to NPR, and, and, the, and he was sharing um, his eulogy about his father. And I heard him speak of friendship, deep, loyal friendships. Since I didn't get to hear the whole eulogy, I caught only about a portion of it, but what I heard was that word about friendships. So later in the day when I got home, I turned on the internet and I found uh, both the video and the transcript of his eulogy. And I, I listened, I watched, and I read along with the transcript. And here are some of the words I heard the son speak about his father. Words that stood out to me. Not political words, but relational words. He said of his father, George Bush knew how to be a true and loyal friend. He nurtured and honored many, his many friendships with a generous, giving soul. And then he said of his father, Many a person would tell you that dad became a mentor and a father figure in their life. He listened and he consoled. He was their friend. And then near the end of the eulogy, the son quoted from his father's inaugural address, offering words that I think we would do well to heed. He writes, or shared, in that inaugural address, and then his son recounted those words. What do we want the men and women who work with us to say when we are no longer there? That we were more driven to succeed than anyone around us? Or that we stopped to ask if a sick child had gotten better? and stayed a moment there to trade a word of friendship. I think Paul was a bit driven. We see this in the way he went about his work. But here in this letter, we see a different side of Paul. Maybe a side that was a different side of President Bush than maybe some saw. What we see in this letter is the caring, compassionate side of a man who was at that moment sitting in jail. He had every reason to be unhappy. 
to be angry, to be bitter. But he writes a letter filled with joy and love overflowing. In large part, he could do this because of the relationship that sustained him. Are these not the words that we need to hear and heed at this moment in time? Even as we prepare to welcome Christ again into our lives, we hear words all around us, words of anger and bitterness and hate. They seem to have taken root in our souls, but Paul invites us to take a different path and let love overflow so that we might know what is good and right and best. And when love overflows, empowering, enduring friendships, then perhaps we can live into the message of the peace candle, which we lit this morning. And in the words of one candle is lit, which we sang, we can sing throughout the day. Come quickly, shalom. Teach us how to prepare for a gift that compels us with justice to care. Our spirits are restless till sin and war cease. The candle is lit for the reign of God's peace. <laughs>